first time he ever been coon hunting. I was hunting a dog called a leopard cur. And I cut that dog loose in there, and he went down in there. Oh, boom, slam, treed. I thought, all right, this is good, because coon hunting can be rough. We walked down in there, and I had this man, this young guy with me. He had the rifle. We got up to the tree, and I walk up to that dog and leash it up. And I'm fooling with the dog, getting it leashed back on the tree there. And he said, what is that? I said, what are you talking about? He said, stop and listen. And I stopped, and that dog quit barking for a second. And all of a sudden, I could hear bark raining down on the leaves above my head because it was summertime. About that time, about a 300-pound black bear comes sliding down out of that tree like it was on a <laughs> fireman's pole. Landed. I'm talking about that joker landed right in the midst of me, him, and the dog. And he's standing there. He's just frozen because he'd never been coon hunting before. He's got the gun. He's just frozen. And about the time that bear hit the ground, I snapped the leash off of that dog because the dog was my only chance to run this bear out of our vicinity. And those these cur dogs are real gritty. They won't back up. They're I, I mean they won't back up from nothing. They're like a uh, like a game cock man. And uh, that dog tore out after that bear, ran him out. I looked over at that boy. I said, "What were you just gonna? You've got the gun. You just <laughs> stood there and did." He said, I, I, "Well, I thought that happens all the time." <laughs> but that's how many bears was in this area, man. So I'd be out there whitetail hunting, you know, and a big old 500-pound boar bear would come up. You know, I've had them climb the tree that I was sitting in, the tree stand. But, a big, you know, if a big one came by, it's hard to, it's hard not to shoot a yeah. big trophy bear, especially with a bow. Um, so I've killed two, but when we kill them bear... I would just, uh, there was a lot of poor, real poor people that lived around in there. Well, I, there was one man named Zachariah. He was about a 90-year-old black man. He had one eye. He hunted year-round because he had to hunt to eat. We'd see him out in the field deer hunting in the middle of the summertime. Wouldn't nobody say nothing to him because they knew he had to eat. But I'd call Zachariah when I'd kill that bear. Well, then he would call all of his people in the community and we'd take that bear down to the skinning shed and within 10 minutes we'd have 50 people lined up at the skinning shed with grocery bags and so we would cut this bear up and process this bear and these you know poor people they'd come down there and get them a big piece of meat well by the time everybody was done they wasn't maybe but one piece of meat left you know what i mean because i don't like bear but i sure do like killing them have you ever had it cook well done well we, we've cooked some at the house but i haven't i mean i haven't that that's what i'm saying i'm not a good cook yeah, man. i just have to learn how to do it my friends john and jen they run uh, an outfitter in uh, their outfitters in alberta and they're bear hunters and mm -hmm. uh, i've been bear hunting with them and they take like a roast and they'll cook it on a traeger they brine it they put it in like a, they marinate it and it's fantastic it's like some of like better than the best roast beef you've ever had oh i know it's there's amazing. a way there's yeah. a way to make it taste good it's all it's also in what they eat you know yeah. if you get them and they've been eating like a dead moose and you know and they've been feasting on that for a couple of weeks and then it's rotten and they just they stink and it's not good. yeah no they want to get acorn bears these bears we were killing what they would they the reason they were so big they were eating corn and soybeans yeah perfect you know <laughs> they now they'd eat a pile of deer guts too i mean yeah they eat everything. I, I, I would I would gut a deer out there. You know, if I killed a deer, I gut it in the woods. I don't gut them back at the house. I just gut them in the woods, and you come back an hour later, and they wouldn't be a, not a not a speck of them guts left. Crazy. I mean, they would eat the fire out of them. Do you know that the early pioneers preferred bear meat, and they used deer just for skins? No, I did not know that. Yeah, the, like Daniel Boone and all those fellas. They, those guys, they were bear hunters. They Everybody wanted the ate, fat. They, yeah, they wanted the fat, and they ate bear meat because they thought it was closer to beef. Huh. Yeah. Well, it is closer to beef, yeah. I would say, than, than deer. Yeah, I would say so. Especially if, it, if it's cooked well, it's delicious. It's just you got to get a bear that's not eating rotten meat and not mm -hmm. eating fish and and cook it right but if you cook it right it's fantastic it's really good bear sausage is fantastic it's all just in how you get it prepared yeah how you do it Rennell is really good at well it. see i gotta start running in the right circles with people that can cook yeah that's my problem my friend jesse who owns this uh, restaurant out here called die Due. what is jesse's that uh 
he's he runs a school that teaches people how to shoot hogs how to how to butcher them how to cook them and you know he he likes old ruddy old hogs and he really knows how to do it correctly so this is it um this is a new school of traditional cookery so jesse will take people and he'll take them out there teach them how to hunt teach them every, everything about it how to how to stalk an animal how to dress the game how to cook it and prepare it and what the cuts you're looking for and he teaches classes on this how cool is that it's amazing man. i mean it's a small class because he wants to do it correctly but he's incredible and that restaurant, if you ever get a chance to go to it, Dai Due in town, it's amazing. I'm going to go amazing. ahead and tell you, if you can make an old boar hog taste good, yeah, you have got to be a master. Uh, he's a master. He also like cooked diver ducks for us, which everybody says are d- disgusting. Yeah. And they were fantastic. And he's like, it's all just in the preparation. Yeah. He marinated them. He slow cooked them on a, on a smoker. They were fantastic. All that stuff just takes time, you know? Yeah. It just takes time. It's so much easier just to just to cook a ribeye. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? That's the easiest. It's the, the easiest. easiest is, yeah. It's just, there's something about wild game to me that's it's a different kind of food. It's, yeah. It's, it feels different when you eat it. There's more energy to it. Yeah. It's like it's just so nutrient dense. You eat it, and your whole body just goes woo, woo. Mm-hmm. You feel it, you know. Like you cook an elk steak, and you eat that medium rare, and you just biting into it, and it's juicy and ah. Uh. I can't wait, man. Oh yeah. I hope I get one. I, I think I got a good chance of getting one. These boys are serious. Yeah. So. Well, with a rifle, your chances are a lot higher, and I know you're a real good shot. So you're probably in it, a guy like you also could shoot accurately at a distance, which is huge. Yeah, you know, have no idea you're there. You know, you can. I'm sure you can make a 500 yard shot easy, and if your rifle's tuned correctly for something like that, it's like you got a pretty good shot. Have you been? Uh, have you been up to the Yukon Territory at all? No, no, I haven't. I just got back. What are you doing up there? It's been, it's been, you know, it's been quite the journey, both on the on the macro and the micro level, <laughs> to wind up here at this table with you. I, I spent the last about the last month sitting with a good friend of mine, one of my biggest mentors in my life. I sat, I'd sit with him for hours on end while he was dying, uh, and um, then I, I I had to leave him in a went out to the Yukon sorry man uh, we need to talk more about that by the way and uh, I had a, oh, I've got a teammate that I went through seal training and all with <clears throat> he was paralyzed 14 years ago and uh, he wanted to go on a, 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 an adventure and I said well there's a race out there it's a thousand mile kayaking race the longest kayaking race in the world on the Yukon River totally unsupported he said all right well it took, he prepared for about two years and uh, we went out there and did that on the Yukon River wow. and then, uh, I came home and my, my buddy died the day I got home and so uh, it's been a man it's been a while last month or so have you ever got to sit with anybody while they're dying important to you not while they're dying i highly recommend it it will teach you so much man about what's important it has made me grow like i don't know man it just gives me the daggone chills thinking about it and the crazy thing is is the type of person that i used to be i would have thought you know going and sitting with someone who's dying is a waste of time like i got other things to do right you do too we got busy lives well this man he mentored me uh hunting and everything working all that his name was don tidwell from the time i was about 13 to the time i left to go become a navy seal well i did my whole navy thing I got out, I reconnected with Don for a while, but then I started this company now that we have, 3 of 7 Project, got busy. I have a curse from my military service. 
is, is I have this unique ability to be able to forget you ever existed. Uh, when when I you know when you when I get on some sort of mission, and you're not part of that anymore, I can forget you ever existed. And so I lost touch with him because of my own selfishness, and been doing this thing for the last four or five years. Well, his wife called me and said, "Look." He just wants to see you one more time. He's got pancreatic cancer. He's got maybe two weeks left. He just wants to see you one more time. Good night, man. Took a lot of courage for me to go show up in front of him and sit down with him and say, Mr. Don, I'm sorry I haven't been the friend to you that you deserve. Will you forgive me? He's laying there dying. He looks back at me and says, Son, there's nothing to forgive. I mean, just like... And and then from that point, I'd go sit with him twice a week for eight or nine or ten hours, just sit right there by his bed. I'd read the scriptures to him. He only had a third grade education. We read about the gospel and we read about the resurrection and we read about creation and you know we don't the first thing that you learn i think when you sit with somebody that's dying is that death is the great foe that that sits above mankind and scoffs at our wisdom you get what i'm saying yeah. he, he said the death is this great foe it is the enemy that sits above us and mocks the wisdom of man uh, Mr. Don had built a, a, an, a basically an empire within the in, uh, within the community he lived in. He had made millions and millions of dollars as an entrepreneur. Couldn't read or write, but um, he still had to succumb to this process that's coming for all of us. Like I don't know, man. That was like that. That just hit me, like. We think, we want to look up at the sky and we want to explain how the cosmos began and we can't even solve our own biggest problem. We can't solve our own biggest problem. Which is death, right? It's the, it's the biggest problem for all of us. Yeah. We can't figure out how to solve it. How to overcome it. Like, we don't think about this enough. Like, have you ever thought, why are you dying? Have you ever thought about that? Sure. Like, like not like I get it. Like all of us, we understand death as you know we go along through this life, but and then something happens. We get hit by a car, one of our organs fail, cancer happens, whatever, and we say that killed us, right? And that thing did kill us, but your entire life is leading you to that point. Like why? do you have to die like it's it's by necessity you must die why what's killing you what what are you what's killing you well age your body stops reproducing correctly your cells don't reproduce correctly anymore. so why does that happen though well, what's animal, causing that every animal almost every animal on this planet has a, a timeline that it exists in it's probably it's probably a, a natural function of keeping a balance. Like, all of nature has a balance. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, you can imagine if mosquitoes lived a thousand years, what a fucking pain in the ass that would be? No, they get a couple, of, but, you know, how long does a mosquito live? A week? Mm -hmm. How long does a fly live? A week? Good. Because otherwise we'd be fucked. You know, a deer, a good deer, a good deer that's like the best days of its life. It's like 13 years, it's done. It's mm -hmm. over. It's gonna. It's, it's limping. It's going to get torn apart by coyotes. Whatever gets it. Everything has a time. Because if it didn't, then there'd be too many people. There'd yeah. be too many the animals. Balance would be, the balance would be all yeah. fucked up. That's, that's a great answer, man. The like, thing is, there's a lot of scientists that are working on that. And a lot of <laughs> scientists that I've talked to that are treating aging like a disease. So instead of just accepting the fact, like, oh, you're 50 now, things are slowing down. Like, well, why are they slowing down, and what can we do to reverse that? I love thinking along those lines, yeah. man. Like, 
Yeah, I, I love that. At the very least, what it does is improves your performance radically as an older person. Mm -hmm. Improves your physical performance. Mm -hmm. what, what, was, what people would be capable of naturally with no supplements 20, 30 years ago. It's a very different world today. Very, mm -hmm. very, very different. Mm -hmm. And with all the different modalities, all the different things you could do, like hyperbaric treatments, NMN, supplementation, red light therapy, cold plunge, sauna... All these different things radically change the composition of your body and your overall metabolic health. Radically changes it. And then with hormone therapy and all the other different things that you can do. I mean, it's just a, just because of science and because of people figuring these things out, it's, it's a radically different world than it was in the past. But is, is there a solution? Like, is there a fix for death like is anyone searching or yes. even contemplating that oh yeah 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 yeah. david sinclair is all over that he's a guy from harvard that we've had on the podcast a few times uh, the, he's that's his primary study they're they're treating aging as a disease and trying to figure out what different types of medication what different types of therapies what's the root cause of the cells aging and yep. not reproducing correctly it's yeah. an ugly thing man oh it gets rough Especially if you don't take care of yourself, you know that's the rough one. When you see people that have been drinking their whole life and then they they, they quit at seventy five, and you're like, it's a little late. You know, even torturing your body, forcing your body to process poison for decades. Yeah, you know, and the and also just living in cities alone. You you were talking about that smell, that that weird smell that you get in cities. That's fucking brake dust and tires and exhaust fumes and doo doo and doo doo it's a little bit of doo doo not bad here go to san francisco i found a turd on the side of the a trail human? today a human turd Ugh. it was a terrible log too man <sighs> yeah my wife took, went back and took a video of it 